Okay, so hi there, my name's Stephen Ball. I'm a product evangelist here at Embarcadero. And um, so here with me is uh, Daniel Messias. And um, Daniel's been here with us for uh, a few days on work experience. And um, I thought it'd be great just to find out a little bit about um, his background and what, and we're going to show you something really cool that he's managed to, to produce this week um, during his development. So, so Daniel, you've been doing a bit of Java development in the background, yeah? Yeah, um, I've been programming Java for about three years, um, so I'm sort of quite familiar with that. Uh, I've also done a bit of Python as well. Okay, cool. So Daniel's currently um, doing um, computers at school. He's um, 17. 17, right? doing yeah. my A-levels. Doing his A-levels. And um, whilst he's been here for the week with us, um, we gave him a copy of Rad Studio to sit down and have a play with. And um, not really kind of gave him too much time in the first uh, <laughs> day or so. Um, but it came together with some, some really cool stuff. Um, so we set him a, a bit of a, a harder challenge um, around building a, a game of Othello and, um, and doing it not only in 2D but in 3D. And it took you how long? Uh, about three days, wasn't it, in total? About three days in total. Yeah. So from never using our RAD products before, um, I think he's kind of being a little bit modest on his time here. He literally, in, in, within 48 hours, he'd kind of got a core program up and running uh, and then a little bit of tweaking around the edges to yeah. make it look pretty uh, and so yeah. on. So I thought we'd share with you um, what Daniel's managed to do and um, and show you how he's managed to do it. Okay, so um, here we are in Rad Studio and um, we've got open uh, a FireMonkey project here. Uh, it's a mobile project, a, a HD, uh, sorry, a 3D FireMonkey project. Um, it's just simple as far new. FireMonkey Mobile and then just using the template here for a 3D application. And um, so Daniel, what was the kind of, where did you start from here? So we um, we started with this idea to have um, a counter. We had the idea of Othello and our sort of starting point was a counter that using the 3D animations which we have in Red Studio, we could make it, um, use an animation to make it flip over and flip between the black and white side. And then from that we sort of decided that Othello would be a really good game to work with that and um, using some of the experience I gathered from the first two days making uh, a few games using sort of grids and that kind of uh, game logic um, it seems sort of a really good way to um, try out some of the 3D features of uh, Red Studio. Yeah, so one of the key concepts um, and one of the key things really, you know, Daniel's done some, uh, some work in Java before um, where he basically used an array of an array to to lay out um, some components visually, uh, basically in essence creating a, a rudimental grid, and um, using some uh, logic that he'd kind of rewritten into Pascal uh, in the first couple of days, uh, and having done that in 2D, we thought, hey, great, using the same principles, you can actually use the T dummy. Um, to lay the components out and then rotate the dummy round and then everything looks like it's 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, and in essence, um, that foundation of a board, um, which you've you've then kind of rewritten in uh, in FireMonkey 3D, uh, gives you a start point. And you say the counter is a nice, uh, nice simple one to, to work with. So talking about the board, let's have a quick look at the code for the board here. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the board's made up here of a number of tiles, and you've used the, the rectangle 3D. Yep. Um, how did you find working with that? Um, it, it was really simple to use. All the pro it was really easy to set up. You just create a new object, and all the properties are very intuitive. You said its width, you said its depth, you said its height, its rotation, position. So everything just sort of made sense. So when, when I wanted to make a grid, I just set its position to however much spacing I wanted between each tile. So there wasn't sort of, there was no complexity in setting it up. It was all very logical and very intuitive. Mm -hmm. So um, using object orientated um, programming here, and we're able to create our own tile, which was based on the rectangle 3D, um, and then uh, build some base properties uh, beyond that. Um, and then for the board, um, we actually created a dummy, and then position, uh, well, you, you're creating a number of, tiles within the board aren't you uh, and laying those out yeah so um, within the, uh, the board there's a 2d array of all these different rectangles and all of them are parented to a dummy so that I can move the dummy and when, whenever we move the dummy all the tiles will move together as one 
So this makes the rotation work of the board very, very simple, which is, um, which is fantastic. There's basically, that is it, that's the code for building a board. Um, really isn't much more to it. Now, one of the things that we need to know when we're playing the game is that the board's being clicked on. Mm -hmm. So using the, um, we created a T Othello tile click event um, because we wanted to be able to send through the actual tile so we knew where the which tile it was that was clicked very very quickly and easily rather than having to typecast something uh, and that was as simple as just declaring a procedure of an object um, which we could then hook up to and um, this was uh, something that we, we got Daniel around in terms of uh, you know, potential future component work where you could actually convert this board into something that could be used for Literally anything. So you could almost go and build a game of chess now. Yeah, chess, checkers. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is great. So once we've got the board, and you've got your tiles on the board, um, obviously um, you, we then went and built the, the counter. Yep. So um, explain what happened in terms of the, the journey of the, the counter. So um, we originally started with um, just two basic cylinders. One would be a black cylinder, one would be a white cylinder. We just stuck them together. Uh, both of them parented to a dummy, like the board, so that we could move the top and the white sections together as one counter. Um, and then later in the project, once um, once a lot of the board and the counters um, were all in place, um, Steve helped me create make the counters look a bit nicer. So we added uh, two sort of flat spheres to the top and bottom to give a, a sort of rounded bezel to the sphere. And then we added some um, some light materials so we could get some sort of reflection from a light source on the camera, which we set up in the project. Yeah, so it really made it look like it's you know alive and, and right there, mm -hmm. didn't it? So um, the the light materials that we're using, we created an Othello black and Othello white material, um, just to make it easy to call from code and and to use in kind of different programs if we wanted to. Uh, and the great thing, Fine Monkey has um, material sources. It has a number of different material sources: a color material source, which we were originally using, mm -hmm. and then we transitioned to the light material source. But by passing a material source through, we were able to then use whichever one we wanted at any time. Uh, and then we just created a couple of simple objects um, that had defaults set to them, um, so we could just create them on the fly if we wanted to. Um, we also used a numerated type to set if the, uh, uh, the counter had been set yet, and if it was black or white. Uh, and that was quite important for the setting of the counter's state later on. Yep. Um, and explain through, I think it's really interesting to have a look at the actual setting of the counter state um, and explain through what's happening in the code here. So um, when we when we need to change what the state of one of the counters is, whether that be because a piece has been captured by another player or we are placing it in its initial state, um, we'll change the property and it will call the setter. Uh, which then executes the animation, which involves lifting the counter off the board, rotating the counter through 180 degrees, and then returning the counter to the board. And the nice thing about um, the animations in Delphi is that each of those animations was just one line of code to do. Yeah, and, and the great thing here is those animations get queued up and pushed off to the GPU to be executed by themselves. And you know, without having to learn any shade of language or anything else like that, yeah. Um, you've been able to compile this and run this out onto Windows, onto Mac, onto iOS and Android. So we're using DirectX out on Windows, OpenGL out on the Mac, and then OpenGLE, uh, OpenGLES out onto the, the two mobile devices. So um, literally, let's say, within three days, all of this stuff for all of the platforms has been yep. done. Okay, so... That's a, a brief little bit about um, about other code uh, and about the game. I guess probably the next thing to do really is see it in action. So I'm just going to go and hit run here. Now, um, most of the time you've been developing this, you actually developed it on Windows, didn't you? Yeah. So um, although it was a mobile application, he's been using the Win32 um, debugger here, which produces a Win32 application um, that allows you to then go and place and uh, run, uh, you know, run the code. So this is great. Um, what we can also do now um, is also go re just recompile this code out for Android and out for iOS and um, uh, as well. So just to save putting the webcam back up, I'm just going to run this out onto the 
Oh, actually, let's just, I've got Reflector open here. I'm going to just try and open up from my iPad uh, a copy that we deployed earlier and uh, show this through AirPlay. So here we are, this is our uh, iPad on the desk here. So, do you want to go and make the next move? Yeah, sure. It's Black's turn. So you can see there the whole rotation kind of going through, um, which is pretty cool. And if I go and make a move now, you can see everything's kind of running through. So that's pretty cool. You know, the whole the whole game and the whole game logic very very easy to go and put together. Um, you can see the counters down the bottom saying how many are white, how many are black, and so on. Uh, and the same code literally runs directly out onto the Android device as well. Okay, so um, hopefully you can see this uh, this okay. And um, this is the the Samsung um, device running. Uh, and again, just uh, alongside it here, we've got exactly the same app running out onto the iPad. Now, in terms of getting this code running out, um, how long did it take you to get it running onto the Samsung device after developing on Windows? Um, we plugged in the device and saw the drivers, and it worked first time. That was it. Yep. No other code. No. Compile straight <laughs> to the Android. Were you expecting that the first time you ran it? Uh, no, I honestly, I've done Android development before with Java, and it's um, it's notorious for taking a few attempts to get it working. So I was, I was actually pretty surprised. Cool. So um, beyond obviously being able to play out directly onto you know Android and iOS here, um, we're also able to take the same code and recompile it for um, Windows and Mac as well. Um, so let's just um, jump back to the IDE and have a quick look at that. Okay, so uh, in order to get it to run on uh, Windows or Mac, first we uh, created a new FireMonkey project to put in our project group. Uh, we created a new FireMonkey desktop application uh, as opposed to the mobile application we were doing before. So we've already got one created here. And then all we had to do, because the code uh, compiles exactly the same whether it's on mobile or desktop, is just drag and drop the files and we'll create a reference copy inside the new desktop version. Now in order to build to uh, other platforms, we go to the target platform section and we just choose add platforms and we can add to build to Win64 or uh, OS X. And then all we need to do is compile and run and uh, it will run exactly as it would on the mobile version. So this is one of the great things about um using uh, the Rad Studio products is here we've got a 64-bit version of the same application uh, running straight away. Now I said this is using um, DirectX here. Uh, if we just go and choose Mac and compile it out and uh, then we'll be able to see that we've got exactly the same application now on the Mac. And here we have um, the application now running out on the Mac. Uh, we can go ahead and start our game and uh, we can see yeah, everything's playing as it should do out here, which is great. So one of the other things that we can do, because everything is uh, vector drawn in FireMonkey, um, we can go ahead and kind of resize this up, so we've got a, a slightly bigger view of it as well, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so straight away here, uh, we now have a full-sized version, um, which is pretty cool. Great. So brilliant. Well done, Daniel. I think it's. Uh, I don't think you're expecting to be able to do this by the end of the first week here, no. are you? No, not at all. Not at all. And um, have you ever tried to do any 3D programming in Eclipse before? No, no. God, no. I imagine that would be um, a whole other ballpark. No, I've never tried 3D before and certainly nothing that's been as, as simple to use as this. Okay. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, I um, hope you've enjoyed this uh, short presentation. Um, Happy coding, everyone, and um, look forward to hearing what you're able to achieve and, uh, and produce with Rad Studio.